Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mayor Steve Allender. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, this is a presentation that I've not seen yet, this version of it. Uh, there's an updated, uh, this is an updated presentation, so we're going we're gonna to hear about where we've come uh, in these uh, discussions. And then there's going to be a time for question and answers at the end. And uh, we're going to make the rules as we go along. So uh, we're here to learn and find out uh, what's been going on. And we'd uh, encourage all of your participation. There's a microphone when it comes time for question time. It would be nice uh, for you to uh, come over here to use the microphone if possible. If not, we can bring it to you. And uh, after that, I would like to uh, turn it over to the panel. Um, Dr. P, before we get started, we're going to ask our, our lecture here, Jean Tyon, to come up and say a prayer for all of us. information watch over us and be with us as we plan for the our community here for the better of uh, our youth coming up and we ask to watch over each and one of us and our families to Kasha. I pray you be with us and guide us out Um, my name is Tati Wee Means, and um, I'm part of this committee here um, that's working towards a resolution for um, some of the Rapid City Indian boarding school lands, land parcels. And um, I'm also a part of a volunteer group um, with the Rapid City Indian boarding school lands project. Um, that per the, the city council resolution, you know, the mayor's office and the mayor was tasked to you know, communicate with the, the native community here in Rapid City and, and our Rapid City Indian Boarding School Lands Project to find resolutions to these parcels and um, to move forward in our community in a good way. And so um, I'm really honored to be here and to share some of the progress that we've made in developing a plan that will, will be presented to the city council, um, you know, in, in the near future. But a very important part of this process is to get community feed feedback and input um, for all of the, the work that's been done so far. Um, so it's, it's really good to see all of you here tonight. Um, I know that there, were, there are folks that couldn't be here, but it's being live streamed, I believe. Um, so folks out there that aren't able, you're always welcome to um, provide their feedback and input. And also there will be another uh, round of engagement have to receive some some comment and, and input so that we can have um, a greater reach into the community. I know there's some other things going on, summer nights, all those kinds of things. So um, another round of community engagement is really important because um, we definitely want to bring our community along in this process and not impose our ideals or or plans um, on the community. And so thank you for being here tonight and taking the time um, to hear the work that's been put in and to provide some some positive and construction, constructive feedback going forward. So this is just an overview um, of what's gonna happen tonight. Um, we do have a, a presentation um, uh, planned for you. We'll start that presentation with a member actually of our Rapid City Indian Boarding School Lands team, Dr. Eric Zimmer. Um, just to provide the, the ground basis of the history of how we came to be to this point. I think that's always important. So we're, we're starting from the same um, point and have a common understanding of history that led us to this, um, to this stage of the process. And so we'll do that and go into the plan specifics um, in as much detail as possible and um, share a map of some potential parcels that are up for consideration and also would like some feedback on those as well and then um, have some question and answer um, portion to, to round out the evening. And so uh, with that, 
uh, we'll ask Dr. Zimmer to come up and um, just provide a brief history of the project that we've been engaged in. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. My name is Eric Zimmer. As, as Tate mentioned, I'm a historian from here in Rapid City. Um, I am a volunteer historian and researcher with the Rapid City Morning School Lands Project and have been for six or seven years now. Uh, I am not a part of the mayor's uh, group here, but the project, as Tate uh, mentioned, has asked me to come and just do a brief overview of the history of our, of our project and work. I know a lot of people in the room have heard this story before, probably several times, but just in case there's a couple of folks who need a refresher, I'm going to try to give a very brief overview. Um, and then on a quick personal note, I did just want to mention this. <laughs> I have, uh, I'm going through a little bit of a personal health thing, and so if I have to have a seat for a second, Val's going to come up and fill in for me. I'm fine, but on two occasions I have fainted in front of large groups of people. Um, so I hope that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> um, so for anybody who uh, is not familiar with our project, I encourage you to go to rememberingthechildren.org. It's our website. Uh, many of the historical documents, as well as uh, maps, further reading material about the project uh, that we've been working on are available there if you want to take some time and, and go look at that and learn about the different facets of the work. But we always also start with this slide because the name Remembering the Children really speaks to how this project came to be. Um, about uh, seven or eight years ago, some of the folks on our team were involved with the 75th anniversary of the Susan Hospital, uh, digging into the history of that place, when a group of Lakota elders came up to them and said, um, we appreciate the work you're doing on the history of this hospital, but we also need your help finding the graves. And our team said, but what graves? And these women said, our families have known for generations that there are children who died at this school when the Susan Hospital was a Rapid City Indian School. Their, fa their uh, families, in many cases, were not informed of what happened to them, and the graves of some number of these children were lost and not taken care of in the way that we normally uh, honor them. So all of the work that we do as a group began in the spirit of trying to find these children, remember them, and protect them. Just as a brief primer on the broader uh, context of boarding schools in the United States, as many of you probably know, the federal government, uh, as well as churches across the United States in the late 19th and early parts of the 20th century, extending up to the very recent past, <coughs> operated hundreds of boarding schools all across the country. And the fundamental goal of these schools was to assimilate Native children into white society. And the way that they did that, as the um, famous and tragic quote reads, was to kill the Indian and save the man. So at these schools, children were uh, forced to cut their hair. They could not speak their language. They could not um, say prayers in their languages. Uh, they were uh, supposed to wear the clothes of uh, white society, speak English, <coughs> convert to Christianity, and participate in what's called industrial education. So for half the day at these schools, children would go to a traditional learning environment, reading and writing and arithmetic and that sort of thing. And the other half of the day, they would participate in, in manual labor. And for that reason, boarding schools were very, very large. This is an aerial shot of um, the campus of the Rapid City Indian School, taken in the early part of the 20th century. Everybody here is probably familiar with Sioux Sand and where it's located on the hillside. It's a prominent fixture in Rapid City today. But the property of the boarding school actually covered some 1,200 acres, which is over like two linear miles stretching all the way from Bacon Park in the east all the way to the Catholic Church, uh, roughly, that's across from Canyon Lake on the west side of town. So it's an enormous piece of property. And the reason that uh, these pieces of land were so large, as I mentioned, was they had to be self-sustaining and also because the children would go out and milk cows and cut down trees and farm and do all of this industrial work, right? So that explains why there was such an enormous piece of land. So as our team proceeded with our project to find these children, task number one was to try to understand how many of them there were and, and where they died, or how many died and what their names were. And so when you look at documents like this one, this is a part of the enrollment records that we got from the National Archives facility in Kansas City. Um, this is not just a grainy photo. These are on onion peel paper, and this is what they look like. We had a team of uh, volunteers from Black Hills State University um, go spend months and months going through literally hundreds and thousands of these documents and writing down the names of these children. And through that careful, deliberative process, we were able to find, uh, so far, about 50 children um, whose names are listed up here. And in some cases, you'll note, the um, officials at the boarding school didn't bother to record children's names. If an infant was born and died too quickly, they didn't name them. They would just write, child died in the day that were born. Um, 
Um, we believe that it is possible, uh, and in fact likely, that some of these children's bodies did make it home, but it's uh, very, very likely that many did not. There's a couple who were buried at Mountain View C uh, Cemetery uh, here in Rapid City, but there are many more that uh, uh, the families have no idea what happened. In many cases, the families have come up to us since this project started and said, we never knew what happened to Auntie so and so. Right? And so part of our work has been to inform these families and help them get the closure that they need uh, to do this work. Uh, we believe there could be more. For example, uh, many of the enrollment records from the first 10 years of the boarding school uh, disappeared in a fire. Um, and so we just don't have that. And it's hard to say if we'll ever know exactly how many children were there. But our work has always been rooted in understanding the stories of these children. And that's why one of the main goals of the project, first, was to identify them and let their, family knows, uh, let their families know. And number two, to build a memorial uh, uh, on the land of the old boarding school. This map is from part of the uh, con concept drawings that we have available on the website to help you get a sense of what that might look like. And it would be uh, located uh, uh, on the west slope of the hill uh, across from West Middle School uh, over there. This is a map of that stretch of land, all of the boarding school property that extended, as I said, from Bacon Park over to the Catholic Church. It's a very large piece of land in Western Rapid City. And as our team was trying to understand where we uh, believe that these children were buried, they started the very arduous and uh, delicate task of doing plot-by-plot -plot research into the land on the west side of Rapid City to try to think about and figure out where these graves might be. It's an enormous piece of property, and it took a lot of time. And one of the things that emerged, something that we did not go looking for, was something that we found in the records through this process, was the story of how all of that boarding school land ended up getting um, divided up into entities in Rapid City that uh, unfortunately did not include the Native community despite a law that was passed in 1948 that made that land eligible to them. This is the law itself. Um, uh, just so everybody sees, it was passed in May of 1948. Congress uh, passed a special law that gave the Department of the Interior the authority to divide up the land uh, that was the boarding school. If you're wondering why they would do this, it was because the boarding school uh, operated from 1898 until the 1930s. Then it was a CCC camp briefly in the 30s, then it became a native-only tuberculosis clinic before it became the Susan Indian Health Service Hospital, which is now the Oyate Health Center, right? So as, uh, right after World War II, as Rapid City's booming and growing, um, the Indian, or excuse me, the Department of the Interior realizes now that this is a hospital, we don't need all of these 1,200 acres anymore, so we're only gonna keep the part that we need for the tuberculosis clinic, and we're gonna make available the rest of this federal land. And uh, folks in the Rapid City community very quickly got engaged in a process of trying to get access to this land. Again, Rapid City was booming and growing very, very quickly after World War II. And uh, we always like to show um, this slide because you can see at the bottom the statute itself was signed by President Truman on May 20, uh, 1948. And the week before that, if you look on May 11, 1948, the newspaper was already reporting uh, what would happen to this land. So we always frame this conversation to let people in the community understand that there was behind the scenes sort of negotiating and handling as the law itself is being passed and becoming the law, people in Rapid City were already in the process of deciding who was going to get what land. And the law ultimately uh, makes the property available to three different uh, categories of people or entities. Section 1 uh, says that the Department of the Interior can gift for free uh, land to the city of Rapid City for municipal purposes. That's why there's Sioux Park and baseball fields and all those kinds of things uh, on the west side. The Rapid City uh, School District can get land for educational purposes. This is why there's all the elementary schools and West Middle School and Stevens High School and all those sorts of things over there. And then uh, the state of South Dakota could get for free from the Department of the Interior uh, a large piece of property for the purposes of the uh, training facility uh, for the National Guard that's on the west side of town. Now importantly, each one of those uh, entities listed in section one uh, can only get that land from the Department of the Interior subject to reversion. There's a reversion clause in the law that says if that property is not used for the thing it was initially deeded in the 40s and 50s, then it would revert back to the Department of the Interior, and that's the core of one of the issues we'll talk about in the Tate Val will expand upon in a moment. Section two of that law, uh, because of the separation of church and state, Congress uh, decided that, it, that the Department of the Interior could not gift the land for free to churches but it could sell it for a uh, reasonable value. That's why there's lots of churches across the west side of town. We know that in many cases, churches purchase the uh, land for uh, relatively cheap. Um, in some cases, they built you know, uh, churches and just sort of moved on with that property, but in a few cases, there were churches who not only built a church, they also um, 
flipped that property for fairly enormous profits. And we have a very detailed you know, record keeping of all the land parcels and the price that it was sold at and the price that it was flipped for and all of that sort of thing. And then Section 3 uh, said that the Department of the Interior could give land for the use of quote unquote needy Indians. And needy Indians was a term of art at the time uh, used to describe the disadvantaged Native community that was living in Rapid City that everybody, especially people in a, a position of authority in Rapid City, uh, knew needed vital resources like housing and elder care and things that they had been asking for and were asking for at that time. So despite um, uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion within the community, at one point there was sort of an early handshake agreement that if uh, the city got the acreage that became Sioux Park, then the Native community would get uh, land for a neighborhood roughly near where West Middle School is now, but that never materialized, and despite all of the 1,200 acres of property that you see on the slide behind me being eligible uh, to these different groups, the Native community in Rapid City did not receive a single inch of this land. Uh, this is at the sort of cornerstone of many of the things that shocked us about this story. As I said, we went into this trying to find the graves and ended up uncovering what we called sort of a Pandora's box of all these other issues of how Rapid City came. There is one other sort of set of circumstances that connects to why it is that we're so um, focused, not only on thinking about the uh, issues with the land on the west side, but also thinking about a Native Community Center and the Community Development Corporation that my colleagues will talk about in a moment. And it's that what's going on on the west side of Rapid City was connected to other forces that were underway in town at the time. So to be very brief, um, where Harris Park is now located, there was a village of Native people uh, called the Oshkosh Camp, Lakota folks who had come in the 1930s and 1940s from the reservation, lived along the creek, and as you can see in the picture there, uh, basically a, a, a shanty town or Indian camp that's been described by different folks. Basically, people lived in boxcars and tents and whatever they could live in. They worked um, uh, for the Warren Land Lumber Mill, which used to be down by uh, Founders Park and had other you know, um, working class jobs in the community, and did the best they could to sort of exist and live there. Now, um, the Oshkosh camp did not have sewer or sanitation. The city considered it a blight as Rapid City was growing and becoming the tourist destination that we all know of uh, today and know it as today. There was a concern that this sort of roughshod looking neighborhood down along the creek was not great for the city's image. And so there was this effort that was informing these discussions about where this native community would go. Um, this leads me to um, this sort of really challenging part of the story and how it connects to the red, what was going on on the west side of town connects to the rest of Rapid City. As I mentioned a moment ago, there was a time when, uh, in the early negotiations over this property, the native community in Rapid City was um, under the impression, at least for a while, that they would get some of the property on the west side to be able to uh, move into a neighborhood up there and do a housing development a little bit. What ended up happening was a group of um, residents on west side neighborhoods uh, petitioned the city council in the newspaper, publicly and elsewhere, and said, we don't want native people living in our neighborhood. If you let this part of the deal go through, we will vote you out of office, and it's very ugly. So what ended up happening was something that was a little spurious to say the least. So you'll recall from the law that I mentioned a few minutes ago that the Department of the Interior had the legal authority to deed land directly to uh, the Rapid City Area School District in order to uh, fulfill educational purposes. But that's not what happened in the case of the land that West Middle School would later be built on. Instead, in June of 1952, the Department of the Interior gave 27 acres of land to uh, the city of Rapid City, completely legal. Uh, but then, uh, the Rapid City uh, Area School District bought that same piece of land from the city of Rapid City for $15,000. So why would they do this end run around the process that was set up in the law, right? And what we found is what ended up happening was the, the city and the school district made this exchange in order to have that $15,000 uh, come into being. And what the uh, city at the time did was give that $15,000 to a nonprofit uh, ad hoc group called the Rapid City Mayor's Committee on Human Relations. And what the Mayor's Committee on Human Relations did was they used that $15,000 to buy a plot of land uh, north of the city limits across from Best Buy and Lowe's in that uh, area. At the time, it was a rattlesnake-infested prairie uh, that came to be known as the Sioux Edition. The city used that money to buy the land, declared the uh, Oshkosh Camp a blight, and then exchanged land on the west side to create the money to move the Oshkosh Camp and the families that were there up to the north side and left them there. There's these really ugly battles in the newspaper between the city and the county at the time because the city was saying, we want these folks outside of city limits so we don't have to provide them city services like sewer and sanitation. Pennington County was saying, 
we don't want to deal with them either, so there's this tension going on. And what ended up happening was the Sioux Edition was in fact placed outside the city limits, and then Pennington County uh, uh, declared the, the families who lived at the Sioux Edition um, non-residents. They gave them what are called certificates of non-residency, which basically means we acknowledge that you live there, but you're not um, county residents for the purposes of getting uh, any services. So the Sioux Edition existed uh, way up on the north side of town, for roughly 15 years of, without water or sewer or sanitation services from either the city or the county. And so when you look at the map behind me here, what you see is the land on the west side, which is the big oblong piece in the red. Some of that exchange not only did not give land to the native uh, families, it then used the exchange that created West Middle School to move the Oshkosh camp in blue in the middle up to the green rectangle that is the Sioux Edition and leave the native community there. In the late 1960s, the Sioux Edition Civic Association, the families who lived in that neighborhood, organized and got the federal government to give funding to create Lakota Homes, which is the other neighborhood that's right next to Sioux Edition out there. And that's why those two are right where they are and next to each other and have the sort of historic relationship that they do. And this is my last slide, and I'll just end on I'm talking about, again, how we think this connects to the broader mm -hmm. picture of what's going on in Rapid City. When you look at the map that I have in the background there, that's actually from the Racial Dot Map, which is a project that comes out of the University of Virginia. You can go online and look at the racial makeup of any community in the United States and zoom in and see basically where uh, uh, different communities of color live. And the, I know it's faint and hard to see on the screen up here, but if you look closely, all the white space is just dead space, right? But the little blue dots are, um, white people, white families who live in census tracts in Rapid City, and the dark or brown dots are the native families who live in Rapid City. And so one of the patterns that we saw that emerged is as you think about this broad history that occurred from the 1950s all the way up until uh, the late 60s, early 70s, the moving of the native community in Rapid City from uh, the downtown corridor and the creek along the west side up to the Sioux Edition is why the native community to this day continues to be consolidated in the downtown and northern parts of the city, right? Um, residential segregation, in other words, is very much a part of this community's history, and it's baked into these policy decisions that extend back uh, several years. And so understanding, protecting, uh, understanding the story of these children, remembering them, protecting them, memorializing their graves is goal number one. Understanding how this connects to the rest of the community's history and trying to move forward in a constructive way is goal number two. And then thinking about how to actually move forward and put that into practice is what Tate and my colleagues will talk about in a moment. Thank you all for your time. I made it through without passing it. <laughs> so how did we get to the point um, we're at this evening? Thank you, Dr. Zimmer. Um, I thought you might pass out just because you were talking so fast. <laughs> I'm like, you have some time. It's OK. Um, and so we offer several years of having these conversations and sharing this information across the city with you know, a variety of communities and individuals, um, you know, conversations began with the city of Rapid City, um, you know, attempts made with the school district as well, but um, you know, much of the credit to the city, they're, they're resp responsive to these requests and, and wanting to take action to rectify some of these issues. And you know, I would just like to take a moment to recognize um, you know, there's a lot of conversation happening internationally around, you know, the residential schools in Canada, boarding schools here in the United States, and the bodies that were found at those residential schools in Canada. You know, the number keeps rising and rising, um, and a number we probably will never know, like Dr. Zimmer said. And, you know, the fact that we are at the point we are at now speaks volumes to um, the want and the, <coughs> excuse me, the want and the will of this community to try to find some sort of healing um, and create a healing path moving forward. And I think that's a testament to, you know, the efforts of the Native community here in Rapid City for decades and decades trying to rectify a wrong, um, trying to get equal access to, to land and opportunity to um, create a cohesive community. Um, but then also a testament to, you know, folks here now in this community that want to, um, to find that healing and truth and healing and reconciliation, right? And this is a part of that conversation. And so to the credit of this community, you know, we're probably a few steps ahead to some of these other communities that are, that are wrestling with the discovery of these bodies and what are the next steps, right? And so this is a, an example of some of the things that can be done in communities to find healing. Um, and so, you know, back in the fall, there were a city, series of conversations with the city council, presentations, numerous presentations, um, and then a resolution was passed by the city council actually in the middle of November, um, 
you can see the, the formal resolution number there, and that's where um, it indicated that the mayor was supposed to work with the Native community and the Indian Lands um, project team to find resolution to the, you know, a land exchange in combination with some monetary um, dollars so that we could um, move forward with, um, with these certain parcels of land. And so, um, so we came to be here this evening. Now, as a, <clears throat> a working group, the idea behind the overall structure of this plan is to have um, two nonprofit organizations that are linked. Um, the formality of that, you know, is to be determined. It's you know, welcoming input in that process as well. But having um, two separate boards of those nonprofits that will um, be interlaced somehow, uh, share common board members in some way. Uh, but very formalized, very structured, um, and each having its own um, scope of work and charge, right? Its own articles of incorporation, all those legalities that come with the formation of a nonprofit. Uh, one will be a community development corporation that will be focused on profit um, generation, revenue generation, and the other will be um, dedicated to uh, an indigenous community center here in the uh, community. And so that is the structure. Um, like I said, the very specific details about what will be included in those formation documents, who will be the founding um, incorporators and the first board members, that's all to be determined. And so um, I don't want people to get um, too caught up in those specific details, but just to think overall as this broad structure, how they will be connected, because we always want the Community Development Corporation to feed that profit um, generation into supporting and subsidizing the um, community center. Um, so that's the, the structure that's being proposed. Um, and now we'll go into the specifics about the community center. I'd like to take the mic. So one of the things, whenever we reached out to the community and they said, what do we need here? And what our Uchis wanted for the past 70 years was an indigenous community center. A place where we can inherently be Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. A place where we can have a centralized location where we'll have organizations where they can have office spaces to serve our indigenous community. And uh, let's see, the history. So I, you'll see up there, this is not new. The Winona Club attempted to bring an Indian center long ago. For, for nearly 70 years, we've been attempting to get an Indian center here. And the land to, we're still determining where this will be. But we definitely know that's something we need here in the community is an Indian center to serve our indigenous people, where our youth can go and be free, where our elders can go and what our elders say can sew in quilts and have bingo, you know, those types of things. But not only that, I know it's funny, but no, it's true. We like to do those things. And where we can send off our loved ones in the way that we know how, the way that we want to. Right now, all we have is Mother, but Mother Butler which is ran by the Catholic Church, right? And we can't stay with our loved ones. We have to leave, and that's not the way that we send off our loved ones. We stay with them overnight. You know, we want to be able to do those things in a space for us and by us, right? And the priority, so we did have a community survey in 2019, and 75% of the indigenous community stated that they wanted to have this community center, and we know that it is needed around any given day, around 24% of the community of Rapid City is indigenous. And so, and we know that just because we know around 25,000 indigenous people use Susan, you know? And so we know that this is needed. The population here is comparable to that in what we, you know, Chicago, Minneapolis Indian Center. Those places, all those metropolitan places, which are much more bigger than Rapid City, our, rap, our indigenous community is, this, is similar. And so we need this space, right? Not only for that, but to, I mean, it's a healing moment, right? To, between the native and non-native community to right our wrong and to provide a space for us. You can see that us, what they called quote unquote needy Indians, we did not receive any of those parcels of land, right? We, needed, we did not receive any acres and we've been asking for several years for something. And this is what we want is a community center. And the purpose, so um, the nonprofit is Hesapa OTP. We already have a nonprofit status since 2018, I believe. And it's to build a beautiful state of the art, culturally appropriate, something that is built by us, something that 
is, you know, circular, relational to what we believe is to be, you know, we're going to be following star knowledge, all these different things, but it's going to be, we're going to have input of what this will look like and, um, you know, what could we have in a community center? That's another thing. You know, we did have a survey, and we, we want feedback today too. What do you think we should have in this Indian center? You know, um, a place, I know they want a gym for the youth so they can play basketball or what have you and use that gym to provide journey services. But these are just some examples. And then, like we said, a safe space to reconnect the Kota, you know, indigenous culture, um, to character, ceremony, community, cult community, cultural awareness, and identity. We know that historically, when it comes to like Rapid City Indian boarding schools, the residential boarding schools, part of that era, era was to strip us of our cultural identity. And so the community center will also serve as a place where we can reconnect to our culture and to our identity so that we can thrive as an indigenous community. And that not, not only good is good for the indigenous community, but the community of Rapid City as a whole, right? to encourage a broader culture of unity and respect within the native and non-native community, right? Promote healing between us, the betterment for present and future generations. And so our wonderful um, architect, she just graduated with her master's degree and she, this was part of her thesis and just showing that, you know, this is from our ancestors, we're a vessel, we're continuing this work. Um, we've had members that have passed on since, but there's a core group of us that were part of Hesapa OTB, just continuing that work, and of course growing with, and working with, and you know, not imposing our beliefs, but working with the city, Rapid City, community organizations, the native community, you know, our elders, our youth, our families, right? And so we're all part of this community and to provide feedback for the betterment of all of us. And some of the community outreach was after, you know, the survey with, um, we did a drive-through event. We have an online survey that is still out there right now. And what was really wonderful about this survey was that it was opportunity not only for our adults to provide input, but also the youth. If you look up here, um, we have a picture up here that one of our youth did. And they, we said, well, what do they think a better community would look like? And this was MMIW a place where our indigenous women can be safe, right? Our indigenous youth can be safe, protect our native people, protect our native nations. And so that was very, I mean, I cried when I seen this because that just tells us that our youth do not feel safe. And so this is going to be one of the purposes of the Indian Center, right? And so there was like our drive-through event and we're continuing this outreach today and we'll have another meeting. Um, we want all of the input and we want to update. That's why we're here today. So part of that survey, there were 342 participants, and you'll see the age here, 25% were 55 and older, 12% were 17 and under, 18% between 18 and 30, the majority actually between the ages of 30 to 31 to 54. And so and the majority of them were indigenous, 86%, with 14% being non-indigenous. But that's just showing you, you know, we, we said we need more input from the youth, we need more input from our elders. Because we see that us in the middle age right there, we, we were able to provide our input, but that's why we're here today, you know. Um, and we did have an opportunity to actually talk to the indigenous elders. And I'll, whenever I go to location preferences, I'll kind of talk about that, because that's one of the things they said was connecting to language, connecting to culture. Let's have classrooms here that we can provide language courses so that we can relearn our language, you know? So part of that is that um, revitalizing our language and our ways of being. And in that, in that survey, there were several program preferences, but majority of them under wellness, human, culture, and nutrition services. And I know it's kind of hard to see up here, but we kind of talked about that, you know, journey services and our culture services. They talked about an Indian you know, sweat lodge ceremony, um, language classes, a gym, a fitness center, you know. Um, elder services was actually prioritized as the number one, as you know, as indigenous people, taking care of our elders is our number one priority because they're wise and they're, you know, we appreciate all the sacrifices they have done for us to have the opportunities we have today. So um, th th this is an example of some of the things. 
and we, we certainly can put this up on our website, and I believe it is up on our website right now, too. Here's just some more pictures from the youth, the engaging with the youth. When I think of making my community a better place in the future, I think of a safe place. We talked about that. Food, food and shelter, you know, having food. A lot of our youth are struggling with food insecurity right now. Some of them want part-time jobs. I mean, just imagine we could, we could figure out something to where our youth can have a place that they can provide an income for their families. Movies. What is that one? Demon Slayer. <laughs> Field trips. Oh, what is helping? Oh, helping and saving lives and helping the schools. That's awesome. The basketball court right there. I really enjoy this one. Here's one. Lakota culture and language. And if you look right there, there's an NAP. Those children, they want their ceremonies. And so this place, we can provide that for them. Play area for the children. And so location preferences for this survey, you'll see here downtown Miniluzaha, North Rapid, and along Rapid Creek were the top three. And whenever we talk to our indigenous elders at an outreach event that Tatewi and myself headed, um, our elders said North Rapid. They want to be in North Rapid. Um, and so, I mean, that makes sense. That's where the majority of us are, right? They want something that's easily accessible, highly visible, and close to nature, green space, and parks. Those are like the top three. You also see there's some historical significance to the native community near existing community services near public schools. They were, they were marked lower on that end, but easily accessible location. So when we're thinking about those things, it goes back and forth because easily accessible, we think downtown, right? Downtown Rapid City in the central location of our community. But then our indigenous elders are saying North Rapids. So, you know, you'll help us provide input on that today. It will help us determine too, and I'm sure that will determine where the location of the community center will be. And potential locations, um, and these were just thrown out, thrown out ideas that we thought matched what we were thinking. And, and we know some of these may not be possible, but this was our group and the community outreach that we have done and what their thoughts were. We've heard, you know, city of the executive golf course. And the reason why this was a prioritized location is because it's near Oshkosh, where the old Oshkosh camp is, right along Rapid Creek. Um, and we found that as a powerful place where we can, I mean, ultimately provide healing, and it's near the school system, so I can see why that. Old Prairie Market location, just because it's centralized, easily accessible, um, the same with family thrift. Parcels B, um, prior Rapid City Indian boarding school lands, maybe the Canyon Lake Activity Center, the Farmer's Market on Omaha, Vicki Powers Memorial Park, there's a parcel that's near there, and that's near North Rapid, right? Other parcels were Corner of La Crosse in Omaha, Corner of Campbell in Omaha, and Mother Butler. Um, one of the places that our elders also said was Mother Butler to reclaim that space that the Catholic Church used. And so those are just some examples, and these aren't, th these aren't solidified, but of course those are just some sources. And one of the things we want to do today is kind of get down to well, what parcels we think are most appropriate, because we want to have a, a solid plan that we're presenting to the city council members here, right? And we really appreciate anyone's feedback on this. Building and budget. So the capital around 10 to 13 million for construction, um, three million for initial operating costs before we can get you know the community development development corporation to sustain it, right? And 1.5 million annual operating. And the building we said around it's actually around 30 to 40 thousand 40 thousand square feet for the community center that seemed most appropriate through our research. We have research Indian centers all over the country and we have been, you know, throughout the years. So this is what has come to be is around 30 to 40,000 square feet um, because we do have a large indigenous community here and approximately two to four acres. And now I'll hand it off back to Tatewi to talk a little bit more about the Community Development Corporation. Thank you. Um, 
I love those drawings that the children did. The youth, that that TV slide, I've never seen that before. I might steal that for Thunder Valley. I work at Thunder Valley in my day job, but that, that was pretty awesome from the minds of our young people. They really do have all the answers. Um, so like was explained in the beginning, the structures to nonprofits that are linked, that are joined uh, for this profit generation to, to feed into the community center. And so um, the purpose of our Community Development Corporation is to generate long-term reliable annual operating revenue for the community center, while also making a positive impact in and around Rapid City. So one thought was, why don't we just take these investment dollars and invest them in the stock market or create something to, to create a revenue stream? And sure, that may be an option, but we also want to contribute to the overall environment of Rapid City. Um, and so I think it's really important that when we talk about the Community Development Corporation, that we talk about its purpose of being profit generation. Um, when a, the same survey that Valeria mentioned back in 2019, when we talked about um, this component of the work, when we asked community, we said, what are the top three areas that you would want um, for community development, for economic development? Um, housing was the top vote getter. Um, arts and culture, like a museum. Um, and conference center, hotel and conference center. And so through a series of conversations early on in this planning process, you know, what would make the most profit given the current uh, economic environment, um, especially given the recent pandemic, and what gives the most consistent profit? And that would be the housing sector. Um, and not just any type of housing, but specifically um, apartments, so multifamily dwellings because um, of the need for housing in this community. And so, you know, the, the plan for this Community Development Corporation is to generate profit, but to, to build a series of apartment buildings. And it's not social housing, right? So it's not going to be geared towards low income or just specifically set aside for our Native community, which I know there's a need and there are many nonprofit organizations that are actively working in our community for Indigenous housing specifically. Um, but I really want to make this point clear to everybody that this particular community development corporation is for housing that takes aim at you know, middle income um, tenants and um, creating a series of apartments that will generate this revenue. Um, so potential development sites that we're looking at would be um, a school board parcel land south of Minnesota and west of 5th Street. Um, this would be to um, construct the apartment buildings. And the preliminary plan is to have a series of four apartment buildings um, to go up in our community over a period of 10 years. And so, you know, this is a long-term plan. It's definitely an investment strategy because it's not something that we build an apartment in one year and we're generating profit and already feeding back to the community center. And so in the community center business plan, there has to be some sort of subsidy and, and uh, revenue coming in that isn't dependent on the Community Development Corporation because it will take some time to generate this steady flow of income. Uh, another is LaCroix Links. Um, the plot east of this building, east of Journey Museum, um, Highway 16, Promise Road, there's a, a plot open out there. Um, and the school board parcel, county parcel, private parcel, north of Sioux Edition, that was also mentioned in the community center. Uh, and then another private parcel, north of Mall Drive. So these would be um, areas that would be most conducive for the construction of apartment building that would do very well. And I must say that in developing this plan, it was many hours of conversations with uh, local community developers that um, are very versed and have specific expertise in developing in this community. And so um, while at Thunder Valley we do community development for rural communities, it was really nice to have this input from a local community developer, and specifically that has built and constructed uh, apartment units. So the revenue generation for the Community Development Corporation is after 10 years, as I said, so year 11 of um, the existence of the four apartment complexes. Um, would be at full uh, profit generation with a 50-50 split. 50% um, of that going to supporting the Indigenous Community Center and 50% being reinvested into the apartment maintenance. Um, you know, whether a, a 
property management company accompanies this community development corporation, those are things that can still be determined, but most likely that would be the, the most effective and efficient way to manage these properties is to have an accompanying property management company actually managing all properties to be consistent. Um, and so it's estimated between 500,000 to 900,000 a year will be generated for the community um, center support or subsidy. Uh, so that's an overview of the Community Development Corporation side. Again, I can't emphasize enough that it is not specific housing for the Native community. I know that will be frustrating for many of our Indigenous relatives because there is such a need. But again, the purpose, the sole purpose of this Community Development Corporation is to support our Indigenous Community Center. Um, so we want the maximum profit possible in order to do that, in order to sustain our community center. Because the last thing that any of, you, any of us want is to build a beautiful community center that has no operating funds to continue or maintenance funds to, to keep it um, state of the art. So um, that's the overview of both nonprofit entities that will work together um, in, in bringing some resolution to, this, um, to these land parcels. So with that, we can take any questions. Any, any questions or feedback? And we do have a mic up here, and if you're sitting and do not want to get out, we can bring it to you. Don't be scared. I have a question. All right. On the body of the mic? The red button? No, the black button. Yeah. There you go. I'll just go. Alright. Um, so I'm not a professional speaker by any chance, so forgive me. Um, there is, I was wondering um, if the city has checked out anything um, to do with the, the um, 25 acres of. Um, Bureau of Land Management land that still exists in the city of Rapid City, west of um, the Methodist Church, to see if possibly um, that could be used for this, or if they don't want that location, possibly if the city could obtain that land and sell it to a developer for money um, to put into this um, or something, because it's it's just like the um, land that they were using for the um, Monaluzahan camp or whatever that was called. Um, it's it's the same Bureau of Land Management. Land, but it's 25 acres in Rapid City, city limits. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, the answer is uh, we haven't done any investigating into that parcel of land. I think it was important, and by the way, we've been having these discussions behind closed doors for about six years to get to this point, and I think. I've always taken this position that it's important for the city not to be driving this uh, initiative to be pointing folks into certain parts of town or whatever else. So this is being led by the uh, boarding school land uh, group that we've been talking to for years. So it certainly uh, could be an option, but I would take that lead from the, uh, the working group uh, before we did any investigation into that. And they're doing a good job looking at land, uh, you know, potential land uh, around town. So we haven't done anything yet. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question. Hey, Mayor, what's the uh, city's role been in this uh, up to this point? I'm glad you asked. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that this is a this is a partnership. We engaged in this partnership um, six or more years ago now, and uh, the faces have changed in some of the uh, discussions. But Kibby's been involved in some of those, and 
lots of other folks. Uh, I forget the name. I'm kind of glad Heather Thompson's not here tonight because she always corrects me when I use the wrong name. But we started out with someone who, in my mind, is the Tribal Chairman's Health Board, but that's not the right word. Anyway, the names have changed, but uh, representatives from the three uh, tribes closest to us, three uh, uh, government entities closest to us, and uh, those members have uh, changed over time. But we started out talking about this complex problem, and you uh, could can tell that the uh, history you're given by Dr. Zimmer, this is not something that happened in 1820 or 1875 or 1900. This was, this really began in 1948 and it's been going on since. Uh, the, uh, uh, the way the land was transferred uh, has been investigated by, by uh, Dr. Zimmer and this group. Uh, and there were a few parcels that were especially uh, in question. And so this is a big this is a big deal. And Dr. Zimmer's probably got all the dates on the top of his head of when efforts were made or initiated over the last 60 years, 70 years, to try to resolve this and how quickly all of those failed. So in the beginning, when we started talking about it, I said, okay, let's let's take a look at it, let's work together, but let's don't let's don't be one of those other attempts that is a flash in the pan. Let's try to put some meaningful uh, discussion into this and get this done. Well, this appears to be on his face a legal issue. Well, if this was all if this was all done sneakily or underhanded, and there's really rules about it that weren't followed, then this should be handled by a court. And I'm no lawyer, but it seems like it seems like on its on its face it's a legal issue. Well, there's been threats of litigation in the past, or people considering litigation. And, uh, you know, the one thing, the first thing all of us in the group discussions agreed on was, let's do what we can try to do to keep, out, keep this out of litigation. Because we all predicted that we would be uh, in some phase of litigation over the next five or more years, and in the end, no one would win. So let's try to find a cooperative effort in a way to, to uh, make this right. Now, that's difficult. Uh, uh, philosophically, that's different difficult because if, when we come to an agreement here and the city expends resources and we, we satisfy the, the, uh, the points in our agreement that we're working toward, there's no guarantee that that's not going, there's something uh, that's not going to come up the next day or the next week. This is, doesn't give anybody immunity from lawsuits in the future or anything else. So from a you know, legal perspective, I think that makes some folks a little uncomfortable. Uh, so my role in this has been to um, try to come to an agreement that will establish some of the goals that the Native community has. And so um, the goal has seems to have always been a community center. So what's wrong with building a community center? However we get there, however we justify it, if we look back in time for the last 50 years, all the things that have been built by the city with the vision funds, with uh, other funding, um, there's, there's, there's no reason uh, to think that an Indian Community Center would be any less justified than any of these things. As we saw, there's, there's 12 plus percent permanent Native American residency in, in the Rapid City city limits. And then every day, there's another 12 or 13 percent that are staying here for a day or a week or traveling back and forth and shopping. So ultimately, and this is from a USD study, I think the, I think it was from 23 to 25 percent of our daily population in Rapid City is Native American. So, why would it appear to us that we've been resisting building a community center for Native Americans? So that's the path I chose to take. Not the legal one, not the bureaucratic one, not the one that will get us into the longest discussion so I can hurry up and retire, you know, and not have to worry about it. I wanted to find a way for us to cooperate. So here's what we did. We took these three parcels as a starting point. And this, these are the parcels that are now occupied by the Canyon Lake Senior Citizen Center, Monument Health uh, Psychiatric uh, 
behavioral health uh, services and the Clarkson uh, assisted living nursing facility next to that. We took those because those we were directed toward those by the working group. We said these are the most suspect of the uh, the parcels. So we had an appraisal done, an official real estate appraisal done on these three properties. And we came up with a figure that was right around $20 million in value. So you might say, well, yeah, but that's with the building and everything, and that's with all the improvements that have been made, and it should be for a barren piece of land like it used to be in old days. Well, that's right where I say we're just splitting hairs here. We're just getting too far in the details because the goal is an Indian community center to start with. So we're not going to get there if we're willing to split hairs and, and go down every possible rabbit hole. So we took this $20 million figure, and in theory, the group, the working group agreed, let's start finding a way to fund the goals that are being sought by the Native American community. And if a community center is $10 million, we'll have this sheet that has $20 million on it, we'll subtract $10 million, we'll have $10 million left to work with. Then we have the seed money for the Economic Development uh, Corporation, we put that on there, subtract it from the rest, and we keep, in, in principle, to give equal investment as to what those properties are valued at today. So it's not science, it's not a, it's not a, um, no economist helped us work this out. This is a bunch of people sitting around a table over and over and over trying to find a way to make this work in a cooperative way, in a way that serves the Native American community, in a way that honors some of our commitment as community leaders to take care of our own people in our community. And so it's really very simple. I'm good at simple. And it's really very simple. And however, it does not come without controversy. Uh, because there is this lingering scent of a legal battle. Well, what if? Well, what if? Uh, we can what if this until nothing happens for eternity. And I don't think that's the right course of action. So we have talked, we have uh, <coughs> contemplated a number of possible angles. I'm very happy that the, that the working group has done the surveys and reached out. But in the end, you know what that means? Not everyone's going to agree. Not everyone will agree with this. Uh, there is, even though there's been over a hundred presentations, the full-blown presentation of all the history uh, of the boarding school and the land and so on, there's a very small percentage of this community that has seen those presentations, even after a hundred presentations. So when it comes down to time, when it comes time to make a final decision on this, there's going to be many community members who feel left out of the loop. They won't know that they won't know what's been going on. They want to start all over. They'll have all the same roadblocks, the mental roadblocks that we've already kind of worked through behind these closed doors. And uh, so it'll seem like we're starting over and over and over. And it could be that this just becomes controversial. And I have just just warned you. This is the only thing I'm fearing right now is that during the pandemic and ever since the pandemic started. I'm just speaking for myself, but I've got a feeling I'm not alone. Elected officials have been taking a beating uh, with every issue that's been made controversial. So we have kind of adopted a philosophy of trying to keep our head down a little bit. Well, this particular issue does not allow anyone to keep their head down. This is a heads up uh, in, in full daylight um, decision making that has to be made. So where I kind of feel like we're at today, right now, is that we're going to schedule another public hearing. Not everybody, there's about 30, 35 people here tonight. Not everybody in the community who perhaps is interested in this has got a chance to weigh in. We're just making more opportunities for people, people's voices to be heard. And then we are going to get together, the working group and the group from the city. We have Vicki Fisher here, who's our community planner, and uh, Mike Derby, who's a state uh, representative and uh, we're, we're all going to get together and we're going to decide how to present this and when to present this to the city council. Uh, so uh, what that means is sometime in the not too distant future the city council is going to have a decision uh, to make about moving this project forward 
and I know there are some documents that have been created by um, architects or <coughs> other uh, construction related <coughs> estimates and things of that nature. We still have some big decisions to make about the property that may be sought for uh, these projects. So there's so the decisions all haven't been made yet. But in concept, we'll need to know if the city is going to move forward with this or not. Just so you know, the mayor is not powerful enough. I cannot make a, an executive order to divert $20 million into this project. If I could, I would. But I can't do that. In fact, uh, I have very little authority here except for to convene this group to get to a proposal to get that proposal ready for the city council, who is the legislative body of the city of Rapid City, to get their approval or disapproval on it. So that's really where we're at today. And so I, I'm just guessing at this moment, we're about a month away from presenting this to the city council. But you know, things have gone slower in the last year uh, because of all the changes to our schedules and the, and the chaos that comes with the pandemic and so on. So. Uh, can't give you an exact date when we're, we're going to look at a council agenda, but it's going to be sooner than later. So that's been the city's role in it thus far. I have uh, given you the short version, believe it or not, and uh, so my role in this from here on will be to work with all of the folks up here <coughs> to get this uh, presentation ready, uh, to answer all the uh, city council members' questions, hopefully most of them in advance but also uh, prepared to stand with this group and make a presentation to the City Council. Um, this is a presentation, when I watch it, when I read the documents, I get a little squirmy. I feel, I feel badly that this land was uh, used in this way. What, and that we don't know the intent of all the folks that were involved, most of them are no longer here. We don't know how all this went, we can only speculate. But as I said, this was not 100 years ago. This was many of us in this room were around when this was going on, especially Richie Nordstrom. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, that's where we're at. Now, any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. <coughs> Pat Jones, City Council member, go ahead. Thank you very much. When I first saw the presentation, a few months ago from Dr. Zimmer and others about the Indian boarding school lands. I was appalled. I lived in Rapid City almost all my life and knew absolutely nothing about it. So obviously there is a problem and the problem needs to be worked and fixed. My concern with this project revolves around one word and that's standing. If this project were to go through 100% and this group representing the Native American people in Rapid City, some of them representing the Native American people in Rapid City. The minute the ink is dry on the piece of paper, another group could come forward and ask for the exact same thing. So I struggle a great deal to understand how this group has standing to come to the city and ask for a project to work towards uh, the quotes that were done about healing and peace and this kind of thing. We have people in our community who believe that terrorist acts are the way to communicate with us that we just saw over the weekend. And so a group that has standing, in other words, that has the right to come forward and say we're representing this group, um, has the right to come forward and, and push this through. But I am not convinced that any one organization has standing to come to the city and ask for a $20 million project. I believe something needs to be done, and this is exciting to hear some of these ideas. But I can't move forward with it without knowing that the group that's bringing it forward has legal standing, is endorsed by, by the tribes or whoever they say they're representing, and can convince us that they are the group to bring this forward. And I asked this question months ago when it was first brought up at the council meeting and it's still not answered to my satisfaction. So that is a, an open, honest question. I would love to support it. I would love to see 
our relationships in Rapid City continue to get better? They need to. There's a wonderful group of Native American people that live in Rapid City. I have good friends who are Native American people who live in Rapid City. A lot of our Native Americans that live in Rapid City get a black eye from some of the other activity that goes on. So that is the heart of my concern. And I, I need to be convinced of that before I could vote to commit $20 million of city money for a project like this. Thank you. So I'm happy to answer or to address your question in part, and another member of our team can weigh in too. Um, but um, in a, the the entity we're standing is the Department of Interior um, because of the the federal act um, and the status of the land. The Department of Interior has standing, and according to their letter in 2017, um, very supportive of the efforts to find a solution moving forward. Um, as Dr. Zimmer stated, there's a reversion clause attached to these land parcels, and so the action of the Department of Interior could be to revert those land parcels back into their um, control and to, to give to the needy Indians in Rapid City. Um, per the definition of the statute, we would be the needy Indians of Rapid City. Um, and so that's always the primary option, I guess, that's on the table by the Department of Interior. But as stated in that letter, they are very much in favor of the city working with the community to find a solution so that we don't uproot those individuals that are on that on those parcels, which would be the result if they were to be reverted. And so um, this is a part of that process, to find a solution that works for everybody, including those individuals on the parcels, um, but still meet the needs of the Indian community here in Rapid City. Did I miss anything? Oh, and oh, I'm sorry. Um, and then on behalf of like who who are we to speak for the Indians? And never do we ever claim to speak for every Indian. We're not a monolithic group. We all don't think the same. We're not homogenous. Um, but we do our best to try to reach a majority of our um, Indian community, as you saw through the surveys, through presentations, through invitations, personal invitations to meetings. Um, but we also have been very diligent about reaching out to um, our treaty councils, to tribal governments, um, Ogallala Sioux Tribe, Rosebud Sioux Tribe, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, the three closest um, tribal governments to the Rapid City area and, and has the highest population of Indian people here. Um, and then all of the treaty councils, the Ehumptawanch uh, Treaty Committee, Black Hills Formation Treaty Council, and the Suchongo Treaty Council. Um, we had the resolutions of support in the fall when it first came to the city council. Uh, we updated them about the progress of this plan um, with the nonprofit entities. Just recently, they had a large treaty gathering here in Rapid City, actually, at the Holiday Inn, um, and provided them uh, an opportunity to ask questions and all supported of this effort. I mean, their concern is obviously not to obviate or to detract from our treaty claims and in no way to does their support um, relinquish any of those um, assertions of our treaty rights. And so uh, we've really done our best to reach um, all aspects and levels of our, of our um, tribal governance structures as well. Yeah, we do have resolutions of support. Um, we'll sure. that compassion and understanding uh, need, is needed because without that uh, I don't think Native Americans would get nothing. Uh, the whole state was a Native American at one time, the whole country. So what's the problem with building a community center? That's nothing. All the lives that were lost, millions of people died in this country. So what, what is the big deal about a community center? Does Indian life mean anything? To me, it does. You know, I, we need understanding, compassion, forgiveness, and then we can move on because 
we, we're not going anywhere until we learn compassion and forgiveness, understanding. A community center is nothing to me. Uh, you know, I'm not Native American, but I'm intelligent, and I do have compassion. So I, I just want to say that because the, we owe the Indian people a lot. I just want to say that. And we do want to mention what does it mean, you know, not being supportive of something like this? It's only perpetuating divisiveness in the community between natives and non-natives. And that's something we just do not want to do. We want to be able to heal as a community. And part of that, of course, it's facing those historical challenges and having to have critical conversations about our history that the city is ashamed of. But well, how can we move forward in a good way, right? And so that's why supporting some of these things and how we get there, like Mayor Allender said, having an Indian center is to benefit all of us. If you think about it, we'll be able to have stronger identity, which means resiliency. I have all the research that connects it to how, you know, if you have that resiliency, you'll be able to work, you know, all these different things. And, you know, as we thrive as an, as an indigenous community, that only strengthens our entire community. And so I don't see, you know, why not support something like that? So I hope that you have a change of heart, Pat, and that you kind of look at it in that way, think about our future generations and how this will impact them. Um, because it'll have a great impact on all of our community. Thank you. I think, sorry, Kitty. I think uh, Oliver Jones' question, though, is a very logical question. And he's representative of people who are going to have the same question. And that's our job to explain. And, you know, my job, I'm not the, I'm not the lawyer, as I said, but uh, uh, so my, my wish is that we can go forward and build a community center and build some of these things. And if, if the day after another group comes forward, we can deal with that then. Well, we've not lost anything except a community center. You know, we've not lost anything. We've gained something. So I understand that, that this can make people uncomfortable, but I don't believe uh, Pat's question here has anything to do with uh, you know, his feelings towards Native Americans or anything else. As I said, on the face, this appears to be a big, fat legal issue. And the natural thing appears to be to send all the teams of lawyers in to start fighting it out. We just know that we know we can estimate the outcome of that uh, is that we dislike each other when we're done uh, we draw more blood on all sides and, uh, so I'm you know that's but it is it has got to be understood that this question is is not just for one individual this is going to be a common question so I think it's the more explanation we get about Department of Interior you know and, and when we were getting all this ready one presidential administration was going out, another one was coming in. Now, every, just about, if not everyone, almost everyone at the Department of Interior is new since January. That's how it works. Everybody starts over. So, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, I think, need to bolster our uh, dialogue about the role of Interior, and maybe even hear from Interior uh, themselves on this issue. Kitty, sorry to interrupt. Good evening. My name is Kimmy Brown, and um, I was involved in the early part of this with the 75th anniversary. I worked at Suzanne for 10, 10 years, but I don't want to talk about that. I just want to say, the liberty of universal laws in our Lakota beliefs and probably many cultures, reciprocity. Reciprocity is you receive, you give. It just kind of goes that way. And the Department of Interior purchased that land back in the 1800s for the Rapid City Indian School, where my grandmother went, where her brother died there. My grandmother sent her kids to school there, my aunts and uncles, and, um, and so on. But um, if we look at how much we benefit, look at West Rapid, I mean, what does that do to our city? We have beautiful parks, right? We have beautiful schools. We have churches. You know, this, this, the residents of Rapid City have really enjoyed the benefits of that land that's still to this day federal land. And we've kind of been left out of the equation, even though we're written into the law. And I hate to throw out the word, but I'm going to say oppression. I, my dad grew up here, graduated in 1953, Rapid City, or Rapid City High School. And 
He doesn't speak about it, but people like Charmaine Whiteface, when they speak, they talk about growing up in oppression, okay? And it makes me cry when she talks about that, because my family doesn't talk about it, but I know it's there. I can see the anger. I can see it kind of coming out in other ways. But um, So I just wanted to keep that in mind, that how much we benefit from this land, and maybe it's time to give something back. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is no other community in the United States has such high levels of poverty in their native community. We have 50%. And I don't know the current census, but that's based on 2010. So why is there such a high impoverished rate in Rapid City? And are we going to continue on, you know, as things have been, you know, and make that gap even wider? No. So I think part of the solution, the, the Indian Cultural Center, is really to su be supportive. We Native people really need support um, to come together, to be a strength to each other, to have our culture identity, just like they were saying, like Val talked about. So really, this is going to help Rapid City. If we can help the Native community improve that number, help people get out of poverty, um, that helps everybody in the whole city. And I know Mayor Allender is the former police chief. The police department, they know these things probably better than anybody that, you know, lifting people out of poverty really is a strength to our, our whole community. That's all I wanted to say. was about what, what does this involve giving back land all 1200 acres uh, and that's there's been some confusion about that and correct me uh, you guys if I say something wrong here there's been confusion about it because we've called it even I've called it a land swap and that's really not a, an accurate term for what we're talking about here uh, if, if any land is to be acquired and used for these projects that we're talking about uh, it would be either land that the city already owns or land that the city could acquire, purchase for these projects to be built. No one will lose land. Uh, th that's not the point. The point is to find existing land, use that, and uh, so there's really no swapping taking place. Does that answer your question? How much land is involved? And the three parcels. Three parcels. Oh, how much land is involved in the three parcels? Yeah, the map is the map is 1,200 or so acres, I believe. Uh, that that was originally the uh, tribal land. North Rapid and downtown, along the river, and then you mentioned the senior center. Yeah. Okay. Here's the land we're talking about. Here's the three parcels we're talking about. It's about 30 acres. For doing what? For putting the tiny setting? No. The three parcels we spoke of are the parcels that are in question. Those parcels we've achieved a real estate value of. And we're using that as a benchmark then to use to purchase land or use city land and use city resources to build a community center. So no land will be changing hands unless the city buys it. And there was a map with a lot of parcels up here, but um, I think I'm not answering your question. Do you want me to take it back? I don't. I don't know if we. I don't know if we can answer. I'd also be happy to show you afterwards and show you the map specifically. Talk about what. So what if, in order to make things right, was was the proposal to propose? What's being proposed is to for the city to build a community center to put seed money into an economic development corporation, and then other things, some annual operating revenue for a period of time for the, uh, for the uh, community center, 
and then see what the balance is of that. Uh, I imagine there could be additional money needed for the memorial for the children uh, and other things, but that would, that would, that I think that would get us all here agreeing that we've, we've come to an agreement and made a deal. With a $20 million cap? With a $20 million cap, because that is the, that is the figure of those three uh, parcels, the value, yeah. So the only land, give back. And, the, sure. and for the apartments to be built for the economic Correct. Yeah. Yes. I think it's important that we understand that the 1,200 acres, it's those three little parcels of that whole, but the ownership is in question. The rest of it is in current legal standing. It's those three little parts that have some some issues with who really should be on that land. And so they're trying to make up the difference between those three parcels. So if they were supposed to get the land, but the three of us got, I just picked you because you're close to me, the three of us got the land because People change hands, I'm related to you, somebody gave me money, whatever way we came into possession of them wasn't right. And so we're trying to right this wrong. And the people who currently are on those properties, they didn't do this. Like my, I work for Monument Health. Monument Health had nothing to do with it, but it's the parcel. Yeah. Thank you. My, my name is Richie Nordstrom. I'm on the city council with Ward 2, but we're still number one in everybody's hearts. So <laughs> I like to brag about Ward 2. And that just, just, just a, well, we're in Ward 2 right here at this location. But since the mayor mentioned my name here, is that's the year I was born. It's 1948, so that's why I got the honorable mention here today. The reason I am supporting this is because of the uh, people that have been involved in this since I was introduced to it. And I used to know Kibby as Kibby Conti. Now it's Kibby Brown. And, and I used to also know you from uh, being in the Navy as well. Are you still in the Navy? Still, still, okay, good. Good organization. <laughs> I came out of the Navy as myself. But anyway, um, the reason I'm supportive of this is because uh, the uh, uh, people that I've known that have informed me, some people call it lobbying, and since I see Representative Derby in front of me here, is that he gets lobbied a lot. Here on the city council, I like to refer to it as we're getting educated. So I appreciate all the education that is coming towards us. And I was very thrilled to be part of the resolution that the mayor came up with. And I, Greg Stroman was also in the audience here earlier. He was also another participant in the heavy lifting on producing that resolution. And our converse, at least in my conversations with Heather Don Thompson, is what we finally came up with, a resolution that's really workable. And I think it will happen. And what we, what I am supportive of it is what the mayor points out is if this gets into a legal battle, nobody's going to win except for the attorneys. That's the only people that are going to win out of this. So I'm very. Uh, that's another reason why I'm supportive of this uh, resolution that we're coming up with. And really would like to see all of these ideas that have been presented tonight. Um, a little bit more detail on them, because I really like them. And if we can get those ideas coming from you, uh, I, I think they're going to be the best ideas that we can have for this community. So I just wanted to leave you with the thoughts of, of keep, coming, keep coming with those ideas, because uh, what I've seen so far and what well, we've been able to work with is I'm looking forward to some, uh, this, some kind of a resolution 
And I want to finish up by, by saying that I'm going to steal a line from the mayor that he's used in the past. He and I are definitely not attorneys, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. So, <laughs> so we've, been, we've been able to get educated on that uh, part of it. So if we can keep this out of court of any kind, I think the community will win and, and, and keep it in the hands of the community instead. So thank you. Nervous? I'm not going to pass out. I don't have a health condition. Doctors know. Um, so my name is Shelby. I live over on the west side, um, and I keep my kids' brains from melting on their devices by going to the park, going to the aquatic center, doing all these great things that the community has provided that make Rapid um, a place where I love to live. Um, and so I guess my question, um, I was kind of spurred by your um, comment, Councilman. Um, we have, a, we have, we know, we've talked a lot about this tonight, that we know we have a population in Rapid that is a quarter, depending on the day, a quarter indigenous. Um, and we have all these great community, we've had, you know, all these great community spaces, um, but we haven't got a space specifically for indigenous people, which, which feels to me like it's, the boarding schools explicitly said, please don't be native, don't speak it, don't look it, don't act it. Um, and I feel like to not have a community center space specifically for indigenous people now is, is our city implicitly saying, please don't be native. Um, don't speak it, don't act it, don't gather. And so my, my question is, because um, I think that's a very fair point to say, how can you say you represent everyone? Um, so my question is, with all these great spaces that we currently have, um, why was this something, again, thinking of like implicit and explicit, like if you're a, if you're a city that has a history with boarding schools, um, I feel like as the community learns about that, sort of your initial reaction would be to distance yourself from all of that. And I feel like a really great way to, to do that is to say we don't want to send the message explicitly or implicitly to be anything but you. Um, so is there a reason, I guess, thinking of, of them representing these people. Is there a reason that the city didn't do something like this without the input of, of, an, of a representative group? Just because we'd say this is something that should happen, just like seeing that the Civic Center needs to be improved upon or seeing that another park needs to be put somewhere? Or is that long comment, short question, is there a reason that we didn't do this before without the input of any native people to say, to me. Well, yeah, good question, um, and uh, and I don't have good knowledge of the previous attempts to resolve this, but I came to live in Rapid City in 1985, and I learned really the details about this boarding school a couple of years ago. Uh, well, I, I started learning about it six years ago. I really got to the to the meat of it through this group a couple of years ago. So I think I'm pretty, uh, you know, pretty average uh, person as far as paying attention to what's going on in the community. Maybe above average. This is just not talked about in many circles. There are uh, Lakota elders who certainly know of it, have lived it, uh, have passed it on to uh, other. Uh, children and grandchildren, but this just doesn't, just did not seem to come out. And, uh, you know, when when this uh, presentation, I got to see the draft presentation. Uh, I was one of the first people to see the first draft presentation. And, and uh, you know, I, I said, we need to name this uh, an inconvenient truth. Because we just didn't, we didn't, I didn't know about it. And I wouldn't say anybody else really know, knew a lot about it either. So I think that's, you know, I can't stick up for anybody in the past, but I would say it's probably never came up to this level of detail before. We never had Dr. Zimmer rooting out all the details of this thing before. So I think we're, we're, we've already won a little bit in terms of bringing awareness to this. 
And you know, it's one thing to hear about you know, some other part of the country, they're tearing out a statue or they're doing it, there's a whole group of people saying, oh, you can't fix the past, yada, yada, yada. I mean, there's this argument in America now over everything, and that's one of the things. But here locally, we have people living, some people in this room that experience this trauma in one way or the other. And, uh, but I, you know, there's a lot of details we can get lost in. That's why I choose to stick to the detail of Native Americans are an important part of our community. And we, we and they deserve uh, the, uh, the dignity of having some of these goals met. So I, I plead guilty for not knowing and for not being in a position to know or not listening if anyone ever mentioned it. And I'm probably like everybody else in that boat as well. Mayor, I mean, hindsight, we could certainly have cleared some in hindsight. We should have. Mayor, can you expound? A, uh, the other part of her question was about past efforts for community centers. Mm -hmm. um, and you showed me a document today oh, yeah. going back to the 70s and what's happened and what hasn't happened. Right, there's been, uh, we found, we did a remodel at City Hall and we found this document. And, and, and it doesn't even, I don't even know who put it together. But it's got drawings and hopes and dreams of the Native community for a cultural park and cultural walkways and, you know, a center and a place to celebrate their own heritage and uh, their own history. And I never saw this until we did a remodel and we cleaned out a bunch of offices. And so I made a copy for the group and gave it to uh, Heather Thompson. And I have another one here. And, and uh, one of the things uh, in that was a performance center. I'm not sure what exactly they call it, but it was a performance center, like an outdoor uh, uh, space for uh, dancing and, and so on. How, how else? But, uh, but uh, and there was about 10 or more years ago a proposal to the vision, the city's vision fund, for powwow grounds. And the city set aside several hundred thousand dollars for powwow grounds that would be built right here on this nine acre lot in conjunction with the Journey Museum uh, on the north end of this thing. And frankly, um, the group that was going to put this together could just could not get it off the ground. But I also admit that the city wasn't right there to help them either. I mean, it wasn't the city's project. That's not. It was a private project, pitched as a private project. So um, that was, uh, in my time here, that was the closest we ever got to fulfilling any of those uh, goals of the Native community. It just didn't pan out. So that's where we're at today. Bev Warren. I can't help it. I have to say something. And I'll stand over here. I am um, probably the oldest one in this building right now. And my birth year was 1939 in Penridge. My father went off to World War II to serve in the Navy. Came home mid-40s. Couldn't find work you know, on the reservation, Penridge. So he brought the family here. So in that time frame, I was six or seven when we moved here. They must have heard that we wouldn't be able to rent here. For one thing, it was too expensive. Secondly, the white people didn't want us here. Although it is Lakota land. How ironic that is to me. I didn't mind living on the, on the Indian camp, Oshkosh camp, as people call it. We call it Indian camp. And the pictures that uh, Dr. Zimmer shared with the tents, that's what I lived in. We were resilient kids. We weren't wimps. We were hungry half the time. But here I am. 82 years later, still working for our equality and equity. And this is what it is. 
It's more than equality, it's equity. If you don't know the difference, look it up. Study it. Think about it in a deep way. That I know all of you can do that. That's what I love to hear. However, living at Oshkosh camp as a child, I did not feel marginalized because we were surrounded by Lakota people who knew our language. In the evening, if we were out playing and it was getting dark, people told us to go home. It was a village. It takes a village, right? So when I listened to all this and all the arguments, the age-old arguments, they're going to want more. Please stop thinking that way. Think about the community today. Think about our children, my grandchildren. I don't want them to live what I have to live through. Although it may be stronger and resilient, we have to be resilient to have survived what we have along with the trauma. You can balance it out. But one way that you as human beings can help make this happen is to go with this well thought out plan. I'm so, so proud of these young women here. They're very deeply entrenched in who they are as Lakota women. And they've taken the effort to get higher degrees in Western way of thinking. And this is the group that put this together. So there's nothing bad about it. There's nothing evil about it. It's all good, and it's justice. And that's what we have to think. We have to think that way for a change. Forget frontier racism. That's what I call it. And think as a human being. If you're a Christian, think about a Christian. And, and cooperate. And let's make Rapid City something to be proud of and not known as racist city, which is what the native community in this nation call it. We need to stop it. We need to stop it. We have a great opportunity to do that today. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Beth Warren is the nicest woman I've ever been afraid of. Uh, she has been there uh, advising people and guiding us and her calm and uh, her own and sharing her own past. And uh, it's a joy to be around you, Beth. And thank you for being here. Um, yes, with no other questions, we can. Just finished with any closing remarks from, from the group here. And um, just want to thank everyone for being here. For those that ask questions, pose the questions. Um, thank you for that and for taking the time to hear um, about all of the work that's been put into this project and this plan. And um, I was feeling really emotional yeah. earlier. And I think that's just a part of the. healing that comes from uncovering truths, recognizing them. And when I hear um, when the mayor said to give our Native community the dignity they deserve, I don't want my children to feel like they are not wanted or seen. And this is a first step in creating a community where our babies feel valued and feel seen and feel wanted and not buried in unmarked graves. And I thank you for that comment because in that moment I felt seen as a human being 
end. Sure, we can get lost in the details of the legalities. I'm a lawyer, I know. And in fact, I've been arguing for reversion in, in, in my groups as we have to work on it. We have to work on a compromise, right? We have to work on what would be best for the community, for our young people. We can go engage in a legal battle. We can go to the DOI and say, just revert them and uproot all of those people. And where would that leave us in the way of healing and peace? Not very far. And so it, it really is just a question about finding a way to, to get through this and um, to show that our young people, indigenous, non-indigenous, that every child deserves to be seen and wanted and heard. So I thank you for that. Jenny Reed. Um, I have a question. I can talk after that. <laughs> it's kind of emotional. Um, a friend sent me a message. Um, she's a teacher in the school district and she's watching on the live stream. Um, she had a question about two of the proposed parcels, um, which are areas of the school bond was to go forward and approved at some point. What would become of that? Um, one site was by the Parkview School and would replace Robbinsdale, and the other site is by Vicki Powers and would replace Horace Mann. Um, so if the school, bo school bond went forward and that, that was approved, um, what would become of that, um, those <coughs> two options? That's a good question. and. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm willing to be corrected on this, but I think the, the, the what's happened here is that this group has looked at all available parcels owned by the city and the schools. That doesn't mean there's been any agreement about the school or the, the school selling any of those. Uh, so that would be a bridge needing crossed uh, if that site was chosen. So that's where it's at. Very preliminary on site selection at this point. But uh, thank you for the question. Well, folks, I think we're about wrapped up here. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for listening and uh, your questions especially. And, uh, you know, we're a, we're a good community. We just don't know it all the time. I uh, appreciate you being involved. This has been a time when not many people have been willing to come out from their homes and sit in a presentation and hear other people talk. But I appreciate you being here a great deal. And thank you very much to the ladies over here on the panel and to uh, Vicki and Mike for being here as well. And we'll stick around a little bit if you want to chit-chat. Thank you very much.